Half mile and third mile dirt track competition always gives fans their money's worth. Hi, I'm Ed Bruce. Today we bring you the ultimate dirt track confrontation. The Moody Mile and the Super National 100. The Moody Mile is a dirt track oval. It's situated near Syracuse at the New York State Fairgrounds. It's a dangerous and unforgiving track. It should prove to be quite a challenge for our outlaw sprinters. Two aspects of today's racing differ quite a bit from the normal world of Outlaws Clash. First, the length of the track. At one mile, it's over twice the distance these Outlaw Sprinters normally run. Second, the structure of the event. Instead of running a number of elimination heats leading up to a main feature, the race is simply a 100-kilometer, 63-lap sprint. Be a red flag pit stop approximately two-thirds of the way through. As breaks in the action occur today, we'll be coming back to Nashville, Tennessee in the Nashville International Raceway. We'll show you some classic moments from past World of Outlaw races. Right now, though, up in Syracuse, New York, Brock Yates and Steve Evans are getting ready to call for you today's Outlaw Oval action. Gentlemen. You know, if you go to one of the World of Outlaw races from coast to coast around the United States, you're probably going to see them run on a half mile dirt, but not here at Syracuse, New York. This is a mile of dirt and one of the most famous miles in American racing. In fact, the first man to ever win a race here was in 1909, and his name was Barney Oldfield. Over the decades, all the great race drivers have run here in American Championship Racing. Jimmy Murphy, Rex Mays, Wilbur Shaw, Parnelli Jones, Mario Andretti, Billy Vukovic, Jimmy Bryan, the Unter Brothers, you name it, and they've run here. And it's an extremely interesting racetrack and a very challenging and a very difficult one, one that's full of challenges. For more about how difficult this racetrack is, Let's go to my pal, Steve Evans. You're so right, Brock. There's a great feeling of racing history here at Syracuse, but also one of danger. This flat, very narrow racetrack years ago earned its nickname, the Moody Mile, because literally from minute to minute, you don't know what to expect from her, especially in turn number two, where I'm standing. It's called the Murphy Corner in honor of the great 1920s race driver, Jimmy Murphy, who was fatally injured just about where I stand. Earlier, I asked some of the outlaws, why is turn number two so very treacherous? Well, just uh, the, the front chute is probably about 120 foot wide, and you get over there to the back chute, and it's probably about 40, you know, coming off of two. It gets real narrow, and the, the racetrack just just real, real narrow. You get it usually has maybe a, a car width and a half wide to the corners and coming off. And you know, if you try to go around somebody, you just get up in the marbles and hit the wall. Why is two uh, so difficult? Because you can carry a lot of turn speed into turn one and around the, around to the apex, and then it gets real tight and straight down the back straightaway, and it's about 20 foot wide coming off there. And if you don't get off just right, you can get out in the dust and hit the fence easy. And if someone tries to challenge you into, uh, that can get you in trouble as well? Yeah, just as well, either way. Either the challenger or the guy that's getting past, either way they can get uh, dinged up pretty easy. Turn two is tough. The next turn's no piece of cake either. This flashing yellow caution light has warned a lot of drivers of trouble ahead as they enter turn three. And that's really because the racing groove is only about a car and a half wide. If you try to pass here, you're liable to get out into the loose dirt and maybe by the wall, as the outlaws told us. Well, it's, it's awful hard because three, you've got to run in uh, uh, hard enough to keep the car stable, but, but not hard enough to slip and slide a little bit there. That, it's really easy to get loose in three and also in two because it's such a tight corner. So. If you really got your hands full, you know, you can run wide open off of four and then have problems uh, getting off, into three and off of two. So it's, it's a tough racetrack. But exiting turn three, if you get high, it's loose? Oh, yes. If you get up there in, uh, in the marbles, you're, you're really loose. And like I said, a guy on the bottom might come by you. And, uh, you, you can't get about, about two cars off the guardrail. All in all, it sounds like you'd rather be in a half length, half mile somewhere. Yeah, like I say, you know, you only do this once a year, and uh, it's an experience. That's enough. Yeah, that's enough. <laughs> well, it won't be enough for these guys. They've got a long way to go. They've got an extra race to run to get into the Super Nationals 100. What we're seeing is the lineup for the consolation race here at Syracuse. Eight of these drivers will move on into the main event, the 100-kilometer feature. And I'll tell you what, Steve Evans, there's some big names uh, scattered throughout this field of consolation drivers. 
You are so right, Brock, uh, especially in the front row, car number 63, Jack Hausenschild. You normally would not find him in the coffee. Well, how about back in row number three, one of the real veterans of outlaw competition, Bobby Allen, car number three. He would normally go directly to the main event and bypass any kind of concede. Well, we've got Todd Gibson and uh, Bentley Warren, two real veterans of super modified competition, and also Indianapolis 500 veterans. Uh, Gary Albritton, one of the hot young drivers in uh, Super Modified. Brett Hearn, one of the best modified drivers on the East Coast. He's in this field running a sprinter, an occasional drive for him. Normally he runs the coupe type uh, modified for the East Coast. Earlier, Brock and I asked both Jack Hodgenstrahl and Bobby Allen what problems they experienced that forced them to run in this consolation race. I'm with Jack Hodgenshield as one of a couple of really hot runners who didn't make the uh, qualifying cutoff and is going to have to run in the B feature uh, here at Syracuse. Jack, what's that do for you in terms of strategy? Well, we didn't, we qualified real bad, so that'll give us a, chance, a little more time on the racetrack, which we probably need, and, and hopefully we can get the thing going a little better. Uh, what was it, just hit chassis problems here on the mile? Yeah, a little of that, and we worked with the motor a little bit, so I think we're going to be better off today. Well, Bobby Allen, I know you would have rather avoided the B feature and gone directly to the main. What happened? Well, I, we bought a new car up here that we didn't get. We hoped to run it last weekend, and it rained out. So bringing a new car into a mile is a little bit... Um, this place, when you come here, even run your own car, sometimes you're off a little bit, and you got to get it adjusted. And then I didn't know whether it was a car or what was going on, and I think all it was, I had the car too soft because uh, Rocky Hyde just said he didn't feel well till he stiffened his car up. So we've done that, and we're hoping it really improves the car anyway. Well, Rocky Hodges ought to know. He came in here from Kansas and qualified for the pole in the feature at over 130 miles an hour. And the green is out. There goes car number 63, Jack Hodgenschild, leaping into the lead as they head down into that very narrow turn two. Right behind him, Paul Adair in the number seven car. Well, to no one's surprise here, Brock, Jack Hodgenschild already with a five-car length lead of uh, most of the drivers recognized that Hausenschild had just stumbled a little bit and was going to be ready when indeed he qualified for the 100k race to come. This little man uh, with about 150 pounds soaking wet looks like more like a uh, featherweight fighter than he does a sprint car driver but all kinds of poise and a very, very heavy right foot. Jack Hausenschild, one of the real up-and-coming stars in the world of outlaws competition. And the fans call him Wild Child for good reason. He may be uh, very soft-spoken when you talk to him, Brock, but behind the wheel of the sprinter, he is just fearless. He will go for anything. The race for third is shaping up between Frankie Kerr, car number K-54. Just behind him will be Maynard Yanks in 88 and Gary Albrecht in car number 21. Those are the three cars attempting for the third spot. Gary Albrecht, one of the better-known Midwestern super-modified drivers. He's got, as I said earlier, some of the super modified guys are showing up here with their cars. They're not quite as uh, adaptable to this kind of uh, dirt track racing as these outlaw sprinters, and we'll see more of those later on. But right now we watch Frankie Kerr blasting down that very narrow back straightaway and into turn number three, probably coming down through there at about 140, 145 miles an hour, Steve. Faster than they will go on any track. Joe Gossett, car number double zero, into the wall hard. That is one of the super modified cars you were talking about, Brock. It's worth it for these guys to bring these machines out because if they even qualify for that 100K race to come, they make a fair amount of money. Well, Joe is going to have to dig in his own pocket, though, to pick number double zero because he will not make a dime here this weekend, but he's okay, and that's really the important thing. So as starter Bobby Watson waves the yellow, the wreckers head out of the pits to go out and clear away the Gothic wreck in this mixed field of super modifieds and sprinters backs it down and gets ready for a restart here in the consolation race at Syracuse, New York on the Moody Mile. Hey, from a restart of the supernatural consolation race where only the top eight finishes will go to the 100 kilometer feature to come. Jack Houses child, the car number 63, is looking good. He's leading it. Paul Legere, number seven, right behind him. But the pressure is really on car number 26, Jim Nate. If he doesn't stay eight, he doesn't go to the feature, Brock Yates. You're right, Steve, and there are a whole bunch of guys behind him that want to get past, including the first guy to win the Super Nationals here at Syracuse in 1977. That's Bentley Warren. He was driving a Super Modified. He's still in a Super Modified today. We've got to start. 
And here is Jack Houdenstel sweeping down in front of Paul and Aaron Carr, number seven, to take the lead. Houdenstel out in front in white, car number 63. Behind him in the second spot, getting a little squirrely is number seven, Paul Lachier, the blue car. But right now, it's all Jack Houdenstel in that white number 63. That's a gambler chassis. One of the more famous of the sprint car chassis that's dominated the world of all of competition over the last few years. But this particular racetrack, very flat, very wide down the front straight seat, and very smooth right now. It's really more like asphalt than it is uh, dirt. Which, uh, if there's any advantage for a super modified car in this race, it would be that asphalt experience. It would be. But uh, the way the sprinters are set up, as I said earlier, the only time a super modified has ever won here at the Super National was in 1977 when Bentley Warren won it. But that was before the sprinters began to run wing. So he had a big advantage with a, with a wingless automobile. But right now you see that great big wing up there on top of that outlaw sprinter. Jack Houdenshell coming right at us right now. Right behind him, Paul Latier. And those wings produce the kind of downforce and stability that make these vehicles really, really hook up on a mile track. And in the event of a rollover, they can act uh, to a certain extent as a cushion. Now here is the battle for that eighth and final transfer spot. Jim Nays, car number 26, is in eighth position, but Brock, he, he's not catching number seven. If anything, he is falling back. And that man up ahead of him is one of the best known in the business out of Hanover, Pennsylvania, Bobby Allen, a former world go-kart champion, one of the best in the world of outlaw chauffeurs, a hard driver. They call him Scruffy. As he said earlier, he just came in here with a fresh car. All he wants to do is make the feature, make sure that he's, he's kind of using this event as a qualifying or practice event just to get the car hooked up. So Bobby Allen, off the head there on the left side of your screen, holds off Nate and seems to be effectively holding on to seventh place. Well, Nate is really not putting much pressure on him right now, Brock. If anything, Nate seems to be struggling with that car, not handling as well as he would like it to. Well, once again, he's probably just kind of holding on, hoping to keep that eighth place and move on into the future. He doesn't have much opportunity to move ahead of anybody, but behind him, as we said, he's got some hot shoes, and they'd like to slip past these and make that feature starting spot themselves. So it's going to be interesting, but right now, Jack Hodgenshaw is just dominating this consolation race. As Nace gets a little sideways, getting down to the third number three. That's the kind of classic dirt track broad slide that you don't see very much here at Syracuse. These are so well hooked up, those big wings, those big rear tires, they really run a lot like they're pavement modified. Look at this, going around, Hodgenshaw goes around one of the slower super modified, and that gives Lotier a chance to move up. Look at this, Lotier challenges for the lead as they head into three, Steve. Well, he benefited when Hodgenshaw had to slow down a little bit for the lap car. But now Hodgenshaw is right flat down on the pedal again. He's got approximately 700 horsepower of alcohol burning small block Chevrolet in disposal, and he's using it right now. He sure is. And I'll tell you what, the only guy that's even able to stay anywhere near him is Paul Lotier, the Pennsylvania driver. But even at that, he got a little, he snuck up on him a little bit when they left that slower car. But right now, Hodgenshaw is just moving out. And if he can hold on, he's going to be a factor in the Super Nationals 100 main event. Well, even with a win here, Brock, the best that Houdenstrahl could start in the feature is number 24 from the grid. But I'll tell you what, Steve, the payday here for first place is going to approach 20000 bucks. So it's well worth all these guys bashing away trying to get into that feature. And watch that good race for third place. Kerr, Yanks, and Weaver. Nose to tail as they go down the back straightaway. And right now, though, it's Frankie Kerr holding on to third place as they head down into turn number three. Well, and Brock, the center car of this triumvirate is the guy to watch, number 88, Maynard Yank. In fact, here you see he's moving right up on K-54, Frankie Kirk. Yank's not being complacent at all. He's not satisfied with just the top eight. He wants to get as close to the leader as he can. He sure does, and he, and again, is one of that Pennsylvania crew. You know, Pennsylvania, central Pennsylvania, is a hotbed of sprint car racing. There are certain places around the United States, and some of the very best come out of that league down there. Maynard Yank is one of those guys. He's going to... Gonna try his best to get around Frankie Kerr. But none of those guys, Brock, are from the big towns of Philadelphia. They're from open little villages scattered around the countryside. Yeah, it's very much a small town kind of racing, but I'll tell you what, they're among the bravest of the brave as far as race drivers are concerned, as we watch Frankie Kerr and Maynard Yanks have at it for that third spot here at Turkey. And if you're not out there giving us everything you've got right now, you're not learning anything about tires or suspension or tuning to utilize in the feature to come. And try him on the inside again. And maybe... Well, Frankie Kerr, he's got a 
Jackie Kerr shuts the gate on him as they head down into turn number three, but Jinks may have another shot in as they head out onto this big, wide front straightaway. The chance to pass is going down into turn one. You take the man down low, get a wheel under him, and get it into turn one first, but not to be. Look, though, a lap car coming up. This is going to be an interesting challenge. They're slowing up a little bit. Remember, that's the narrow turn number two, Steve. And just like Doug Wolfgang told us, you saw Mato Jinks get up there in the marble, the loose stuff. We had to manhandle that car out of there, and lucky that he didn't get in more trouble than he was. Well, he'd have taken a whole bunch of guys with him if he did, because he had uh, the fifth and sixth place cars right behind him. But he gathered it up as we watched the final lap unfold here with Jack Howdenschild in the number 63 sprinter heading down the back straightaway. And as he comes into some heavier traffic, Lotier moves up behind him for one last challenge in that blue number seven right behind Jack Hodenchild. So a cluster of lap cars slow Hodenchild up a little bit. Can Lotier get underneath him? Possible, no. Jack Hodenchild sprints off turn four to take the victory, but only by a car length over a very determined Paul Lotier. And what a relief that checkered flag was for any driver who finished in the top eight. They get a shot at the richest purse ever to come later today. Jack Howden's trial, well, he did a flag to flag. Paul Latier was always in it. Maynard Yeh finally finished up fourth. Now, in the eighth and final transfer spot, Bentley Warren in car number five. Now, that is a super modified vehicle. Far different than a sprint car, used to running on pavement. Earlier, Brock took a look at Warren's number five. In case you haven't noticed, this is not your basic all-American sprint car. This is a super modified of the type to run uh, just up the road from Syracuse at a famous speedway called Oswego. This automobile is designed to run on asphalt, not on dirt like here at uh, Syracuse, and it therefore is somewhat of a handicap, even though it's got one of the finest drivers in the country, Bentley Warren, a former Indianapolis shoe, running the car. But the problem is this. It's an asphalt car, and its design is totally different. One, the engine, you notice, is way, way offset sits on way over on the left side of the chassis. The chassis is also extremely low, designed again for smooth asphalt running. This particular engine is a Chevrolet big block. They permit an engine uh, displacement limit of 467 cubic inches. However, the engine is an iron block, which makes it heavier. Overall, the automobile is about 400 pounds heavier than an outlaw sprinter as well. Comes to the racetrack at about 1,800 pounds. They are permitting the fellas here with the super modifiers to run a big wing. It does help somewhat, but you notice there's no a real aerodynamic uh, advantage that some of the sprinters have. So while these cars are extremely fast on asphalt, they operate a little bit of a handicap here at Syracuse. Well, the preliminaries are over. To come, the Super Nationals 100, the richest sprint car race ever run, and the driver on the pole set an all-time record getting there. Oh, for the Super Nationals 100 is the new world record holder in the mile distance, Rocky Hodges, 26.77 seconds over 130 miles an hour. Rocky, exactly what you must have some strategy. You know, you got a bunch of uh, bunch of guys out here going to try to, I'm sure, get by you. But uh, it's pretty much a one groove first turn. Any any feels and feelings about how you're going to handle the first lap? Well, all you can do is just go flat out and try to get there before Sammy does. Uh, that's a pretty big job. And we're just, that's all you can do is just try to get there before he does because, like you say, it is gets kind of skinny there and somebody's going to get through there first. How about uh, you got yourself uh, a big stop halfway. Does it pay off to really run super hard uh, in that first half of the race and then just know you're going to get a restart uh, after the pit stop? Oh, it, it does and it doesn't. Sometimes it, you know, it doesn't help you because... If you get running too hard and you might get in trouble with lap cars or you might not take enough time doing something, you know, it might hurt you or take you out of the race. But uh, on the other hand, if you don't go pretty good, there's going to be cars going by you. Well, stay out front, Rocky, and congratulations again on your lap record. Thank you very much. Okay, and now let's go to Steve Evans with the number two starter. Thank you, Brock. I'm with Sammy Swindell, also in the front row, and until yesterday was the track record holder here at Syracuse. This young fellow, Rocky, alongside you, he's proven that he not only has the horsepower, but the desire to get around here very quickly. Well, Rocky, he's uh, only been driving sprint cars a few years. He drove late models first, and he'll, he'll run a car as hard as it'll go. Does a little lack of experience on his part make you a bit cautious, let's say, going into the first turn? Not really. He's, he's raced long enough, and he's got enough racing experience to know, know how to handle himself. How do you handle this split format, Sam, the, the first half of this? 
Well, it, it, uh, I'd like to be out front, you know, so you could start up front on the, on the next one. But so with a split like this, you really don't want to get the, or, or really run the car hard to, to get a big lead because you're going to lose it when they have the brake. Have a safe drive, my friend. Okay, thank you. All right, let's go to the Brock, who's on the inside of the second row. Steve, I'm with uh, Jeff Swindell. Sammy's brother is going to start third on the inside of the second row. Uh, Jeff, about this kind of two-heat setup on this race, uh, does it pay off to uh, try to run way, way out front uh, and then know you got to stop and you're going to really essentially get a restart uh, uh, with no advantage at all in the second half of the race? Well, the thing is here, it's, it's really hard to pass. The uh, best odds are just uh, try to stay right up front. If you can get a chance, get up front. Uh, there's no sense in really pushing too hard the first half of the deal because, uh, you know, like I say, it, it, a bunch of people aren't going to finish, and I hope we're not one of them. But uh, just kind of feel the race out the first part of the deal and just stay up front, you know, in contention of the deal, and I think you'll be all right. Uh, odds are I think Swindell will take home the money one or the other. All right. Well, I hope you're right. Good luck. Thanks a lot. For sure. Okay. And now let's go to Steve with fourth place. Okay, Brock, starting on the outside of the second row is Brad Doty, who we've seen before. And Brad, the major complaint on this racetrack is it's so narrow and hard to pass. How do you deal with that in the early stages of this first half of this race? Well, I just hope that you stay out of trouble when everybody else has the same idea. It's real, real tight uh, for a mile. It's too narrow coming out of two. You got to be real careful. It's narrow going into three. The back straightaway is uh, a lot worse than the front. But you just try to stay out of trouble this first 33 laps or whatever it is and, and hope you finish good and then go for it the last 25. Does that mean you would take a conservative approach rather to a little more fearless style? Well, you can't get too conservative because the guys behind you, they're going to be driving by you. So you, you have to race hard. There's no being conservative running these deals anymore. Uh, you have to stand on the gas, but just try to look far enough ahead and be a little careful. Yeah, good luck to you. Thank you. We'll have to explain an odd format here at Syracuse. The outlaw cars don't have a transmission, they don't have a self-starter, and they don't have enough fuel to go the full 100 kilometers. So there will be a mandatory pit stop for everybody at the two-thirds distance where the cars will change tires if necessary and refuel to go on to finish up this event. So it's basically a two-heat program, Steve. And considering, Brock, that at the end of 100 kilometers, there's $20,000 to the winner or thereabouts, $10,000 to second place, big money all down the line. You don't see a big name missing anywhere in the Super Nationals 100. Right, as we watch that number four car, Rocky Hodges out of Des Moines, Iowa, get underway. That car is powered by a 406 cubic inch small block Chevy. That's about as far as you can punch a small block Chevy out. Big displacement for a relatively small light car, about 1,400 pounds. And as we said, he got around this racetrack at 134 miles an hour average speed. And on an unbanked mile, that is fair flying. And those who witnessed that record lap rock say it was as much courage as it was horsepower. Right, because Rocky and his friends normally run on banked half miles, and it takes a totally different setup at Syracuse. We've shown you the outlaw sprinters before on the high banks of Eldora and the Devil's Bowl down in Texas. And when you come to a mile track like Syracuse, an awful lot of changes have to be made to the automobile. The most noticeable is in the stagger. In other words, on a half-mile racetrack, the right rear tire is going to be as much as 12 inches greater in circumference than the left rear. Come to Syracuse, it's just half that. The right rear may be six inches more around. As far as the suspension is concerned, much stiffer shocks are required on the mile, and also the torsion bar setup is a good deal stiffer. The wing itself is run at much less angle on a mile track because you have 145 mile an hour speed, you've got that natural airflow. On the half mile, it'll be set like this. On the mile, it's uh, virtually flat. As far as the front end of the automobile is concerned, yeah, the front tires remain about the same. Again, we have stiffer shocks and also a stiffer torsion bar setup. The biggest difference when you come to a mile track is the overall gear ratio in the quick change rear end. Now, here is the quick change setup for a half mile. You're dealing in a 594 gear ratio. If you ran this on a mile, well, you'd blow the engine up in the first turn. It would just over rev. So when you come to the mile to deal with those big speeds, you just swap these two gears. Now you've got a 397 gear ratio to work with. And I'll tell you what, they'll need all the speed they can get here on the big mile at Syracuse as they line up 
and the fans, 15,000 of them on their feet in the big roof grandstand here at the Syracuse Fairgrounds. The traditional World of Outlaws, four abreast, pace lap. They're getting ready for the start. We'll be back for the Super Nationals 100. Outlaws, because they know no fear and have very few rules. 33 wing sprinters, two abreast, circling the one-mile track here at the New York State Fairgrounds. We're almost ready for the start of the Super Nationals 100-kilometer race, the richest sprint car race ever run. Here they come, Brock Yates down for the green flag, and they've got it. Sure do, and Rocky Hodges leaps off the ball to try to take the lead away from Sammy Swindell on the outside. It's Swindell into turn one, right behind him, Rocky Hodges, and he's sideways. Rocky loses it and was very fortunate that he just didn't get T-boned. Gets nudged a little bit by car number five. Rocky Hodges is in the limit right, Brock. Somebody should have hit him on broadside. The whole field scrambled past Rocky Hodges. It was sideways in the middle of turn number one. Of course, the caution flag is out. Sammy Swindell in that red number one sprinter is going to have to back it down and head up the field for a restart. But we've got a whole bunch of cars scattered around in turn number one. That's the uh, number eight sprinter of Craig Keel. That's the number 22 super modified of Craig Sarnier. He's sideways installed in the middle of the racetrack. And on the outside there, another super modified, the number 21 of Gary Albritton, one of the quicker runners in the super modified field. He's sideways and out of it for the time being. And of course, Rocky Hodges, the guy that started it. As you can see, he just got down into turn number one too hot, got the car sideways and lost it right in front of the other car that it is roaring at him at about 120 miles an hour. Jess Wendell nipped by him down low. Kenny Jacobs had him in his sights for a second, got by him on the high side. Everybody clears him except for Danny Smith out of Danville, Illinois. He just nicked Rocky, but I'll tell you what, some fantastic driving by these sprint car drivers to avoid what could have been a really serious crash, Steve. Well, 31 drivers behind Rocky Hodges proved today, Brock, they're as good with the brakes as they are with the gas. Here we see Brad Doty taking evasive action high. Down low comes Jeff Swindell, and no injuries result. A few bent up race cars because Danny Smith coming up here just does tangle with Rocky Hodges. It could have been a disastrous chain reaction accident. As it was, cooler has prevailed, and we'll have a restart of probably all 33 cars. Pace car is out on the track, guiding them around the one-mile circuit. There's a few push trucks out there trying to get some stalled race cars started as well. While we await a green flag, let's again join Ed Bruce down in Nashville. Thanks, Steve. It's apparent that the Moody Mile is giving the outlaws about all they can handle. There's another dirt track that's just as challenging to dirt track racers from all across the country. It's Yankee Stadium, the Rose Bowl, and Pebble Beach all rolled into one. It's the mecca of dirt, Eldora and Rossburg, Ohio. Known as one of the fastest half-mile dirt tracks in the world, it's brought us great moments in the world of outlaw racing, such as the action that we saw here last year. One of Eldora's idiosyncrasies is that as racing progresses, the groove gets higher. Randy Kinzer, brother of outlaw legend Steve Kinzer, found this out the hard way. Kinzer found himself drifting up the track towards Eldora's country wall. Before he knew what had happened, the car struck the wall. All Kinzer could do as the car rolled over and over was to suck himself up inside the roll cage. The large wing absorbed most of the impact. Randy was able to walk away unharmed from the incident. A quick survey of damage at trackside, a night of welding, and Randy was back racing the next day, trying to qualify for the main feature. Randy went on to finish fourth in the second heat. Oh, it's exciting. Let's go back to Syracuse with Brock and Steve. We got a green flag here, Ed, and it's the Swindell brothers from Memphis, Tennessee, and one, two, that red number one of Sammy, Younger brother Jeff back in the second spot. Right behind him, Brad Doty and Doug Wolfgang, who started in the seventh place, has moved up into the fourth spot. Wolfgang, a former winner here, Steve. In fact, Wolfgang, a two-time champion here at the Super National. Swindell has won it once in the past, and Swindell has absolutely no fear of the Moody Mile Rock. He told me he actually enjoys getting out on this blue group. He said it really doesn't take as much physical effort as the short track. Certainly more courage, but not as much uh, out of your physical. Well, you can see that the racetrack is really well prepared. It's getting that real dark blue groove, as you said, which means it's almost the consistency of asphalt. As he heads down into that quick number, turn number three, and out 
on the only broad part of the racetrack. That's the main straightaway. The only problem, though, Brock, with a blue groove racetrack like this is there's no soft cushion to pass on the outside, and we've got one in trouble already. That is car number eight, Craig Kale, who was involved in the earlier incident, nose into the fence. The yellow flag is out. Also involved is Brad Doty, who is running in the third spot. Right now, let's go down trackside with Brock. I'll tell you what, Steve, you know, a measure of a race is how many tow trucks are in it. A real man's race has at least five tow trucks. And uh, in this particular case, when the caution comes out, four out of five of them get underway. Now, that's probably a fairly serious wreck out there. Uh, fortunately, these cars are pretty safe, so these things are usually used just to clear away the debris. But in the case of Brad Doty, it's got to make him plenty sore. He was sitting in third place challenging Jeff Swindell when Craig Keel got in his way when he was being lapped. They both spun out. It looks as if Keel is out of the race. Doty is going to be able to restart, apparently, but it's going to put him way back behind the Swindell brothers, Sammy and Jeff, who dominate. Quickly, your fortunes can change in World of Outlaws Sprint Car Racing. Rocky Hodges, who set an all-time world record qualifying on the pole, now finds his number four car being black flagged into the pit area, and it appears for a left rear tire change. Meanwhile, down in the pit area is Brock Yates with Craig Keel, whose number eight was involved in the earlier incident. Brock? I'm with Craig Keel, who was involved in that incident coming off of turn four. Exactly how did it develop, Craig? I got a little bit loose coming out, and Doty was under me. I didn't realize he was there, and just a little touch, and that's all it needs. You hurt the car off? Just front axle and best of ride. So you're out, but it looks like Doty got back in, huh? I hope, I hope so. That's racing, but glad you're okay. Yeah. All right, Craig Keel out for the day. Well, we're back under green, and look at slamming Sammy Swindell. The red number one car going into turn number one with a huge advantage over the second place runner, his own brother, Jeff Swindell. Earlier, you heard Jeff say one or the other Swindell will take the money home. So far, living up to their word. Running third is Doug Wolfgang, number 29. He'll be up all the way up. Kenny Jenkins hanging on to that fourth spot. Third spot is, of course, a two-time winner here, as you said, in that blue number 29 car, the Weicker Lifestyle car out of Pennsylvania, one of the winningest cars in sprint car history, Steve. He's had a lot of good chokers behind his wheel, and, of course, Doug Wolfgang is one of the very best. But right now, his sights are set on the younger of the two Swindell brothers, younger brother Jeff riding in second place. Right behind him, Doug Wolfgang challenging down the back straightaway. This, of course, is not one of the better places to pass. Even if Doug could get by him, he wouldn't be trying it here. He'll wait until he comes out out of that big, broad front straightaway. But it looks as if Jeff has enough means to stay out front, or at least in second place. Brother Sammy is out of sight in his, your picture. He's got himself a big, big lead out front. But right now, the battle is for second place between his brother Jeff and Doug Wolfgang. Well, Jeff Swindell Rock was the 1981 World of Outlaws Rookie of the Year, and in all three seasons, he has been in the top ten finishers, definitely holding up that family tradition started by their father, also named Sam. A real hotbed of sprint car racing around him at the Tennessee area, and of course, Jeff and Sammy carry that tradition to great heights. We've got some other fine young drivers out of that area in the field as well. Well, after some early lap jitters, everyone seems to have uh, kind of calmed down and running in that blue group. Oh, a blown engine on the part of Steve Kenzer. Steve Kenzer is going to get black flag. That is going to bring out the yellow. That is rare to see an engine failure in any Kenzer automobile. They generally have got the mechanical act just completely wired. But there you saw probably a connecting rod breaking, poking in a hole in the oil pan. All of it drains out. So that may finish the day for Steve Kenzer, the winningest outlaw of them all three-time world champion, and a man who goes after Sammy Swindell with a vendetta. Well, he's not going to get that chance today as he is headed for the pit area in the yellow number 11 car. Steve Kenzer is done. And when he's out of the race, he will totally disassociate himself with it, especially if Sammy Swindell, his arch rival, is leading. He doesn't want to watch that at all. Well, down in the pit area, this yellow flag is out. It's Brock Yates with another driver who has fallen out of competition here in the early going. Brock? I'm with Bentley Warren, who's the champion in the Super Modified Ranks, the former Indianapolis car driver, and came into uh, Syracuse really with a handicap, didn't you, with a Super on, on a mild dirt. Yeah, the sprint guys are running awfully well there. 
they're all capable drivers, you know, really very good drivers, and they're all set up with their, and we just well, gave away a lot of weight. I know you uh, are heading up to a 5 8 mile up at Oswego tonight. You'd probably like to have them come up there, and uh, maybe you could put them on your own turf and pay them back a little bit. Well, they probably wouldn't go up there. They, they, they wouldn't handle it probably as well. They'd have more of a uh, wash than we have here, I think, up there, you know. Bentley, what happened to the race car? You were out pretty early. I don't know if we lost a piston or a valve. Something started to make noise in the engine. It was uh, skipping, so we just came in. You got to go. I know you got to go race tonight. Uh, are you going to get the car ready for that? We're going to try hard. I think we're going to have to change an engine now and okay. try to get up there. Well, up. we're glad to have you here. Thanks for talking to us. That was a lot of fun. I wish we'd run better. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Well, Brock has left Bentley Warren and is headed over for Steve Cantor, which is a little like interviewing A.J. Hoyt if he falls out of the Indy 500. Brock, you there? I'm a Steve Cantor, the winningest outlaw of them all, but uh, not this weekend at Syracuse. It just wasn't working all weekend, was it, Steve, really? Well, no, we uh, come here and we're fighting motor problems. Uh, since we got here, uh, I got one, we get one once in a while that don't run too well, and uh, it just seems like I was it, and it finally uh, started tying up and missed and stuff, and it wasn't going to make it maybe a couple more laps, so we just brought it on in and and hope maybe we can uh, <laughs> look to it and find out what's wrong with it. Well, it, maybe you got all the bad stuff over with on one weekend, so it's clear sailing from here on in. Well, I've had some bad luck here for the last couple of years, but, uh, yeah, we've had a good season, and uh, yeah, we're still uh, happy with the season we've been having, and we just hope next week will be a little better. Well, it sounds like Steve Kenzer is uh, mellowing just a little bit. He was much nicer than I've seen A.J. Boyd. I apologize for that remark, Steve. Well, we're under caution, and that caused Sammy Swindell to lose that huge lead he had. It's a loud brother chap to snuggle right up behind him in the number 80 car. Earlier, I had a chance to talk to the elder Swindell brother, who's as good at chassis setup as he is at driving. Sammy, what, you know what mechanical changes to make to the automobile to run the mile track, but what kind of mental adjustments do you have to make as a driver when you're circling this track? Well, you just have to be careful of the... The hardest thing is the lap cars, because they're quite a bit slower, and they really slow you down. You lose your momentum, and you can't pass them in the corners. You can't just drive on around them. You have to wait for them and then try to get them off the corner. Well, they're slower, and they're going to be geared a little lower, and they usually pull the faster guys just right off the corner. It's real. You have to kind of back up and make a run at them, you know, going in. You don't want to be real close, so you get a run at them through the corner hope that you time it just right where you can get by them coming off. Which is more difficult, a big half-mile bank track or this track at Syracuse? Well, this one here is probably one of the hardest tracks we run on. It's just because it's so narrow and you got to be on top of it all the time. And a lot of guys aren't used to running this fast. Well, I'll tell you one thing. This man, Sammy Swindell, is used to running this fast. He's dominated this race right from the green flag. Right now, we're under caution, but we're going to have a restart in the Super Nationals 100 in just a moment. Stick with us. We'll be back at Syracuse. Since I was a kid, I piled up lots of experience with hand cleaners, from soap to turpentine. The one I use is lava, because lava has the power of pumice. You can feel it. Powering away dirt, powering your hands clean. I'm Roger Gustin. I built the lava machine. Mister, when I talk power, I know what I'm talking about. Lava powers hands clean. Dirt into the grandstands here on the Moody Mile in Syracuse, New York. I'm Steve Evans along with Brock Yates and our buddy Ed Bruce is down in Nashville. We'll join him from time to time. No big story here. Sammy Swindell, number one. Who else? Still out in front. Jeff Swindell is close up right behind him, his younger brother. And Doug Wolfgang is right behind the younger Swindell in the third spot. We are under green again, and look at Sammy Swindell streaking away from the field. This car is really hooked up here at Syracuse, Steve. He blasted off turn four, took the green, and just said goodbye. Right behind him, brother Jeff, and right behind him is Doug Wolfgang. But right now, he's trying to get by a slower car, a lap car, Jory Gravino out of Pennsylvania. And he has got old Doug Wolfgang kind of blocked up there. That could give brother Jeff Swindell a chance to break clear. So we got the Swindell brothers way out front. And here comes Doug Wolfgang still trying to get by Jory Gravino. And poor Jay, Kenny Jacobs, is in the fourth spot. And now Keith Kaufman on the restart. He made the progress and has moved up to fifth. Kenny Jacobs, who normally runs the All-Star Circuit, currently in fourth place. That's a rival organization of the World of Outlaws. He's kind of an outlaw running with the Outlaws. And uh, doing really, really well. A good young driver, Kenny Jacobs. 
Well, as good as he is doing today, Brock, he may uh, consider enlisting with this particular world outlaw because the red 4J is running mighty smoothly in that fourth spot, and that's a pretty good payday if you hang on to it. You know, in racing terminology, outlaw in the old days meant that you did run with the 3A, the American Automobile Association. If you didn't run with them, they, you were considered an outlaw. Of course, now they've taken that phrase and turned it into a real sanctioning body, the world of outlaws. But right now, Kenny Jacobs has come in. Ronnie Schumann, a regular with the outlaws, one of the original outlaws, running back in sixth place. That's a little bit far back for uh, Schumann. He should be up among the leaders. He is one of the quicker guys in this business. And you can say the same thing for the guy that is trying to chase Schumann down for that sixth spot, number 18, Bobby Davis. Were it not for a new car problem, he might be up with the front runner. Absolutely. Bobby Davis, one of the Tennessee gang, another guy who's come out of the Memphis, Tennessee area and run very, very well. A fine young driver, Bobby Davis. And you see Ronnie Schumann just slide a little bit into that turn number three and then just wail out onto that big, broad front straightaway. Probably knocking on, if the car's geared right, maybe 145, 150 miles an hour as he broad slides it down into turn number one. Well, they tell me, the younger drivers, that your first appearance here in Syracuse is a real eye-opener. You're just not used to going that fast. Jess Waddell in the second spot. The number 29W, Doug Wolfgang, continues to try to pick him up. And there you see Jeff slide past one of those lower, kind of heavier, super modified, the kind that Bentley Warren was driving. Not competitive here, but put him on a 5.8 mile pavement track, and they are rugged. Very fast automobiles, but out of their element in this particular kind of race. Well, Jeff Waddell would like to get close enough to his brother's hand to at least uh, maybe learn a little something about Sammy style, but he can't even get him in his sight. Sure can. Sammy's just so hooked up here that he's just said goodbye to everybody as we watch Jeff Swindell come down the front straightaway. Now stretched out a little bit on Doug Wolfgang. The Wolf is having some problems apparently because he can't gnaw away at that second place uh, spot of Jeff Swindell. I wonder, Brock, though, if we're not that far from that mandatory pit stop. If they're not settling down here saying, calm down, let's not make any mistakes, because after that checker will wind up nose to tail again anyway. Yeah, absolutely right. It could be that Wolfgang reckons that he can't do anything. He may have some chassis adjustments that he wants to make. And all these guys, of course, are going to change tires as we watch Sammy Swindell still dominating this race going down that long and narrow back straightaway. So it could be, as you say, that everybody's just going to settle down and wait for that mandatory stop and then see if they can catch this man, Sammy Swindell. Sammy is closing in on the million-dollar earnings mark. The only other sprint car driver to ever surpass that is Steve Gensler. Sammy driving for three-time world funny car champion Raymond Beetle, a drag racer for the circle track car. They are on the last lap before the mandatory stop. And as Brock explained earlier, they do that because none of these have self-starters. They have to get them all together, do the fueling, tire changing, whatever, and then sprint to the finish. So this is the final lap of the first half of this race here at the Syracuse Mile. As Sammy comes down to take the checkered flag, he's going to coast on into the pit as is everybody else. There you see Bobby Watson, the starter, a double checkered flag uh, finish here. And they've got the fuel cans and the fresh tires and the wrenches out to make some torsion bar changes. You can be sure on a lot of guys that reckon if they can get it set up right, they'll catch Sammy Swindell. Jumping. Brother Jeff second, Doug Wolfgang third, Kenny Jacobs sitting in fourth, and Keith Kaufman, one of the Pennsylvania crew, up into fifth place. So as Sammy Swindell backs out of the throttle and kicks that rear out of its one-speed gearbox, he'll head for the fifth along with everybody else. And you can see some fairly frantic activity going on there for the next few minutes. In the meantime, let's go down to Nashville with our partner, Ed Bruce. Thanks, Brock. Down here in Nashville, we're taking a little trip back and reliving some of the great moments of past sprint car races we've seen. And some of the best have come from a place they call Demon Dirt, the Devil's Bowl in Mesquite, Texas. No other dirt track in the country quite resists the onslaught of the world of outlaw sprinters, as does the Devil's Bowl. As you know, the first four winners from an outlaw B feature generally move up into the main feature. This makes the competition for that fourth spot, the bubble, pretty intense. As the B feature got underway at Devil's Bowl, we saw just how important that fourth position was. Greg Woolley in the 23W car ran over the back of Steve Perry in car number 23, just as the race started. In the replay, you can see how Perry was trying to get low on Woolley to hold on to fourth position. Woolley turned left, ran over the right rear tire, and began a series of barrel rolls. 
The big wing, a predominant feature of outlaw sprinters, took most of the punishment protecting Greg Woolley. Both men walked away from the incident and were back racing the next day. You know, I've never believed that the attraction of motorsports was the possibility of seeing someone get hurt. I was at the Devil's Bowl. And when I saw the crowd stand to cheer an uninjured Greg Woolley as he scampered away from his car, I knew I was right. It was quite a moment. Well, now let's go back to Syracuse and Brock and Steve at the Moody Mile. Well, Ed, we've got a unique situation in sprint car racing. The only race they run all year with a pit stop. They're in the pits now, and we'll be back to cover that action right after this. Well, if there's such a thing as an intermission in sprint car racing, we've got it here at the New York State Fairgrounds, the famed old Syracuse Mile, where the world of outlaws, guys, have pulled into the pits and mass to change tires and refuel and to get ready for a restart here in the Super Nationals 100. The main grandstand jammed with 15,000 fans. The infield crammed up with motorhome. Let's go to Steve Evans with the man who's dominated this race. I'm with Sammy Swindell, who will go out on the pole for the second half of the Super Nationals Outlaw Sprint Car Race. Sam, just a wonderful start, and it's a good thing you were ahead of Rocky Hodges because he had trouble right behind you. Yeah, well, I, I don't. I think he didn't think the racetrack was as slick as it was. It was real, real slick from running that four breath, and then uh, just had a lot of dust on the racetrack. It's getting better, but but it's pretty pretty narrow right now. By narrow, you mean the groove on the racetrack? There's not much there. No, not really. There's, there's a clean groove, and then you get right out of that, and it gets a little dusty on either side. So you have to keep the car, you try to want to stay right in the middle of the, the blackest part because that's, that's where it's the cleanest, and, you, you know, you don't lose any ground. Towards the latter part of that first half, uh, you were in lap traffic. Where did you find it the easiest to pass? Well, it's just like I said, you know, you have to get a little momentum up behind them and try to get them off the corner. I'd, I'd rather pass them coming off the corner than going in because it's, you're going a little bit slower, and, and they're pretty slow, so uh, getting in. So you don't want to be right behind them getting in. You just have to follow them through the corner. Your toughest competition for the second half may come from your own brother, Jeff. He'll be right behind you. Yeah, well, he, he's always run pretty good up here. You know, he, he might have been holding back a little bit. We don't know, but uh, we'll see here in this next one. Okay, thank you, Sam. Good luck. Thanks. All right, let's go to Brock Yates. I'm with Jeff Swindell, who uh, told me he said it's going to be the Swindell brothers, and so far for the first half, at least, you're right. Yeah, I believe so. I, I think it'll pretty much stay that way, I believe. You know, if both of us have some decent luck and just hang in there and, and uh, keep pushing, uh, one of us will take this money home. <laughs> You're, uh, you look like the crew's pretty happy with the, with the race car. Not a whole lot going in there. So I noticed some guys changing gears and tires and one thing or another. Uh, any uh, major changes you're making to the race car? No, not really. We just uh, normally here you, you run the first half with so much staggering and the second deal you go back in and you add a little bit of more stagger, you know, because the track gets a lot more rubber down. It gets tighter. Uh, we just put a little more stagger in. And, uh, now, stagger, just for the folks at home, tell them exactly what you mean about stagger on this race car. Okay, well, the stagger on the, on the car that I'm talking about would be the difference in the circumference of the rear tires. We put a smaller left rear on to make it go around the corner a lot better because when the rubber gets down on the racetrack it gets a lot stickier and it tends to push if you don't have enough stagger so you're gonna you're gonna reduce this uh, the the difference between the right rear and the left rear even more than it was when you started or less than it was no we'll we'll put, make it more different than it was at the beginning and uh, just add a little fuel and take a little break here and have something to drink and <laughs> Get a little traffic or something. That's probably going to be the only way we're going to get by him, but uh, I think we can do it. Yeah. Good luck. I like your confidence. Yeah, <laughs> thanks a lot. I want to thank all the Strohs and uh, Skull people, too. Well, good deal. They're, without them, they wouldn't be here. Thanks, Jeff. We appreciate it. Thanks a lot. And now let's go to Steve. All right, thank you, Brock. I'm with Rocky Hodges. Rocky, was the track just maybe a little bit slicker than you thought it was going to be in that first lap? Yes, it is. It, it's slick out there right now plus there was some crumbs on the track from when was going around slow the, the car on the inside was kicking up dust all the cars were and they just got out on the racetrack and i just spun did you let wendell lead that uh, going into turn one yeah i let him have a little bit of room because i knew he was going to go for it anyway he started out dragging me going down the straightaway and there's no way i could have you know caught him or anything so i had to settle for second there and it just didn't turn out how do you see the second half of this race? Well, I don't think we're going to go back out. I, we're, we got put a lap down because we ended up having a flat tire. So I think we're just going to pull in, call it a day, because we can't make that up and just let everybody else give them the best chance they can have. 
I'm very sorry to hear that, but uh, also on behalf of everybody, congratulations on a world record for the mile on the dirt. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Okay, Brock, so you heard it here. Rocky Hodges will not be restarting. Who have you got for us? I'm a Danny Smith uh, who started sixth, and uh, like uh, Brad Doty, uh, got hooked up real early in the start and just uh, went to the back with some other problems. What exactly was your problem, Danny? Well, I just spun out there on the first lap and got slowed down enough to miss him, but I just couldn't quite get by and hook him with my Nerf bar, and it bent it back in against the tire and uh, had to pull in and take it off and tag the back of the field. You know, we worked our way back up probably to the middle now, so we got 25 more laps to get to the front. It's going to be hard to do. How's the race car? Uh, did it affect the handling of the race car? Uh, the crash didn't hurt the car any. The starting in back, like in, I don't know, 30, 30th spot where however many cars they start, the wind turbulence was real bad, and it's run the car from inside to outside. And, you know, once they get lined out and get some space in between cars, it ain't too bad, but, you know, this, you know, this back here in the back is tough. Kind of takes the heart out of the driver, too, doesn't it? To start real good and then uh, just to have something dumb like that happen to you that wasn't your fault and right to the back, huh? Yeah, we didn't have any hot laps yesterday to speak of. We just maybe got one lap and we broke. Went out and qualified, you know, six quick, and I was really you know, pumped up, ready to go, and this happens kind of... Now we got to work for it now. A lot harder <laughs> we would have had to. Well, good luck. Hope it works out for you. Okay, thanks. Right. Well, that's a down Danny Smith, but one excited crew working on the fourth place car. That is Kenny Jacobs, number 4J, working on the quick change rear end on that automobile. Makes it very easy to adjust the gear ratios for various racetracks. Brock Yates is with the fellow who came in the first half running in the third spot. Brock? I'm a Doug Wolfgang who uh, is running in the top ten, and uh, you got yourself a little time to rethink this situation. Uh, what kind of change are you going to make, Doug? Well, I'm really not going to change that much. I've got more of a... I'm running the third, I believe, and I'm just barely holding my own. But I believe I've got a motor problem. I've got a, I've got something wrong to where the thing isn't scavenging out of the dry sump tank at the moment. And I'm going to see if I can get it fixed. And uh, it, it's, it's what it is is sucking all the oil out of the tank into the engine, not scavenging back into the tank. So we've got to do something. I don't know if we can hang on or not. So we're going to basically work on the motor. And I would expect to fill the <laughs> oil sump up again too huh yeah it's mostly on me at the oh, moment God. well i hope it works out i'm sorry doug it's good okay. luck anyway thank you seldom have i seen doug wolfgang quite as frustrated as he has been here at syracuse this weekend you can see that he really had to force that smile but, but he got it up there brock yates has been a busy guy he's caught up with the driver running in the sixth position that of course is ronnie schumann brock ronnie uh, mass confusion with a stop in the middle did you make any major changes no uh, we changed rear shocks and tried to hook the back of the car up a little bit we left the same tires on put some fuel in and we're ready to go i guess <laughs> It's kind of nuts out here, isn't it, with uh, these, these kind of two races uh, packed into one race? Yeah, it really is. It's, it's like you said, mass confusion, and uh, I'll be glad to get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope the race car stays together and you get out of here with some money in your pocket. I hope so, too. Okay. Thank great. you. Oh, yeah, they say that, but they're racers. Schumann will probably be first in line next year for the mile race at Syracuse. Well, here's the rabbit, two-time world champion, Sammy Swindell. He hopes to get back in that number one car and put another 100-yard lead on him within a couple of laps. And we'll be back for that action. The sprint to the checkered. Stay with us. They're fueled up and fired up and back on the racetrack, ready for the restart here for the sprint to the finish in the Super Nationals 100. That's your leader, Sammy Swindell, leading the field down the back straight. But this man, Ronnie Schumann, won't make the restart. He got underway, discovered there were problems in the rear end of the car. He's out of the car and finished for the afternoon. He gets his wish, Steve Evans, to head back on the road. He doesn't like the Syracuse mile to start with. Shouldn't talk bad about the Moody Mile. It'll bite you even on a pace lap, Ron. <laughs> As we watch Sammy Swindell turn up the wick, run on the all 700 horsepower to take the green flag and down into turn number one. And I'll tell you what, Steve, already he's begun to open out. What power, what handling he's got here today. And what driving skill the man possesses. His little brother can't even catch him, and he watches him just about every day of his life. You know, and everything Ronnie Schumann said about this track is true. It is treacherous. It is dangerous. If you're not on the black part of that racetrack, you're not going anywhere except maybe backwards. As we watch, younger brother Jeff Swindell try to get past the lap car of Maynard Yanks. Remember, it was Yanks who got into this race via the consolation race. But right now, Jeff Swindell slides past him down into turn number one and through turn two. So he's got a clear shot. Let's see how the third place man gets by Yanks. 
Well, now it's up to 29W. Doug Wolf can in that third spot to try to get around that lap car and not lose any ground on the cars running one and two. And they just dangle that left front wheel coming out of the turn. And right now, the number 80 car of Jeff Swindell seems to be opening up a little bit on Doug Wolfgang. In fact, Wolfgang is holding the inside of the racetrack, coming down the main chute, and it looks like he's headed for the pit. So right now, the Swindell brothers, Jeff and the red number 80, and brother Sammy have got the lead. Well, Wolfgang mentioned, Brock, at the break that he was having lubrication problems, and yes, indeed, he is going for the harness. He is out for the day, probably with a cooked motor. Yeah, well, that's a shame because he had a pretty good hold on third place, but Doug Wolfgang now takes the helmet off and walks away from that number 29 spreader, and he is through. A bad break for the Wolf, but good fortune for Kenny Jacobs. His number 4J has now inherited that third place spot. Number 77 keeps off, and well, he has fallen off the pace. But how about 75 Brad Doty? What a charger that kid from Ohio is, Brock. Involved in that earlier accident with Craig Keel, he has now moved up to fourth and going after Jacobs. Well, that's exactly where Doty started. Started in fourth, away to the back of the back, and has now moved his way right back up to a point where he's going to challenge Jacobs as they run down the long back straight away, sweep through that very narrow turn three, and look at this. Doty dives underneath Jacobs and takes third spot. A very difficult place to pass on his moody mile, Steve. Well, I think he went to the Debbie Swindell School of Print Car Driving, because that's what Swindell said. Try to get down low and pass him coming out of the turn. Beautiful execution by Brad Doty, and he has got the fans following his act now. Right in front of him now is Maynard Yank. Remember him. He has been running really pretty quickly, quick enough so he's been kind of hard to pass. He's a left car, but Maynard gets it through the corner in pretty good shape and comes off the corner quickly enough so it's kind of hard for the quicker cars to pass, as you heard Sammy Swindell explain. Here goes Jody. Is he going to get by him? Yes. Nails Maynard going down into turn one and once again has a clear racetrack, but up ahead of him, the two Swindell brothers to see if Brad Doty can run him down in the closing lap. Well, the Twin Dells are going to want to put as many lap cars between themselves and Brad Doty as they possibly can. Just as Maynard Yanks just held him up, they hope they can use that other traffic to their advantage. Jeff Swindell, he is in the second spot, uh, about 100 yards behind his older brother, Sammy. Well, Jeff Swindell, very poised, very smooth, and you watch him drive around a slower lap car. Jeff Swindell doesn't really put many wheels wrong. A very poised young man, and he likes the big, fast miles and the big, fast half miles where these World of Outlaw drivers compete most of the time. Well, right now, his brother Sammy in the red number one car is just flying by lap traffic. He's not concerned at all with little brother. Uh, no sibling uh, association here, Brock. It's every man for himself. Oh, yeah. In fact, he said earlier he was afraid that Jeff might get it. <laughs> yeah, and you can be sure he'd fight Jeff just as hard as he would anybody else in this place would be challenged. But right now, nobody is challenging Sammy Swindell. That is turn one. He's heading down into that very narrow turn two and out onto the back straightaway. Unchallenged here in turn. Did you notice, Brock, that Swindell goes into the turn, especially once, he gets down and almost puts the wheel up against the arm cover. He does indeed. Keeps that car tucked in nice and low. No waste of motion. Notice the car doesn't get sideways much. He drives it a lot like he's on asphalt right now. The car is handling perfectly. Not a lot of uh, broad sliding that you sometimes see a turn do. He just hooks it up and runs it through the corners like he's on rail. Now, Sammy, uh, set his sights on Jack Howden's child, who you remember won the Conti. Well, look at this. Swindell can't quite get around him. And if Howden's child continues to race, his car gets a little bit quicker. He's tough to pass. Now Swindell executes it. He does. I think Jack probably saw him come or felt that there was a faster car behind him and just moved a little bit to the outside to let the quicker car through. You'll find most of the professionals in the world of outlaws will let the faster car through if they are being left. And that's exactly what happened as we watched Jeff Wendell down the front straightaway and into turn number one. In fact, this track is getting so much like that, but we're starting to see some smoke off the tires going into the turn. As we watch Jeff Wendell down the back straightaway, still holding on to second place. That's Keith Kaufman. He's up against the fence and truth, Steve. And what that's going to do is bring out a caution and allow Jeff Wendell to close up on Sam and allow Brad Doty to close up on both of them. The ambulance is over there, but the word comes down the driver is A-OK. -okay. But they've got to slow these cars down in the interest of safety to get that car off of the racetrack. And in the pit area, already talking about loading up is Doug Wolfgang. What a miserable day it has been for him.
started seventh, scratched his way up to third, and then out for the afternoon. Tough break. And here, Brock, an interesting pit stop. This is the second place runner, Jeff Swindell, in hoping to find just exactly the right tire gear combination so that maybe he can chase down his own brother when they go back out. But he better hurry. If he doesn't get out on that racetrack before the green flag falls, he could go a lap down. We'll be back for the final outlaw shootout. You can bet the gloves are off now because only a few laps remain to the richest payday in French car racing history. Jeff Swindell was in the pit. Well, he got back out in time to fall in behind his brother, the leader, Sammy Swindell, in the number one car. Brad Doty at number 75. Well, he is still a big threat to win it all. If there were a hard luck award, it ought to go to the driver Brock is now with. He started nice, got as far up as fifth, and then fell out of the race. Brock? I'm a Keith Kaufman who was running a real strong fifth, and all of a sudden up against the fence. What happened, Keith? Something break? Something broke in a car drive line or something, I think. It just quit running. Well, you just no way to get a restart out. She just snapped, and uh, did, you didn't hurt yourself, did you? No, I'm all right. Just something broke in the car. Right? Well, we're sorry you're up. Thank you. Well, Brock, find yourself a seat because the green flag is about to wave the restart for the final few laps of the Super Nationals 100-kilometer race. Almost $20,000 await one of these drivers. Could it be Sammy Swindell in the red number one car? Most of the fans think so. Scrumping up his tires is little brother Jeff Swindell running in the number 80 car just behind him. And hard charging number 75, Brad Doty. He's got his fans as well. You can get an idea of how slippery this racetrack is. Just turning the wheel a little bit is enough to get him to slide. The green flag is out. It is Sammy Swindell, two-time world champion, headed down into turn number one. to see if Brad can get by Jeff. It looks as if Sammy's just going to say sayonara once again. It doesn't look like anybody's going to catch him, but it could be a good race for second. Hammering down that narrow back straightaway, we see Jeff Swindell right behind him, Brad Doty, and a few car lengths behind him, Kenny Jacob. The racetrack is starting to break up a little bit in the corner seat. Let's hope nobody hooks the rut and he's closing last. Well, there's so many ifs in this kind of racing run. What if Brad Doty hadn't been involved in that early accident? might be in that place Jeff Swindell occupies right now. I don't think anybody would have taken Swindell's spot. Sam Swindell. You're right. Jeff Swindell, second place. Brad Doty, third. And right behind him, Jacobs. Once again, unreeling another lap on this challenging, narrow, and now falling into shadows. The racetrack that they really fear, the Moody Mile at Syracuse. Well, the conditions right now are about as nasty as they could possibly be. And there is the last lap flag. The white flag is out for this man, Sammy Swindell. Is he headed for his biggest ever payday? It sure looks like it. And winning here would give him every major crown in sprint car racing, Brock. Absolutely. One of the masterful drives by Sammy Swindell as he roars off turn four. The checkered flag is out. He's got it. The winner here in the Super Nationals 100, Memphis, Tennessee, Sammy Swindell. And finishing right behind him will be his brother Jeff in the second spot. Following him in the third position, Brad Doty, who really gave us all a thrill today with a masterful driving job. A young man from Ohio that shows up more than just promised championship ability. But right now, it's the two Swindell brothers who form up for a victory lap, Steve. And between them, they're going to go back to Memphis, Tennessee with over 30000 bucks in their jeans. Not a bad day for Brad Doty either. There's a $7,500 check waiting for him. And I'm sure there's a lot of Steve Kenser fans who are plotting out into the parking lot muttering to themselves, boy, if our guy had been out there, it wouldn't have been that easy for the red car. Well, I have to wonder about that, though, Brock. He was just so poised and ready for the mile today. Sammy Swindell, that's as close as you can come to running a perfect race. Right, and you got to remember, the 134-mile-an-hour qualifying lap by Rocky Hodges, and he was out before a lap. But in all, a terrific day of racing here at Syracuse. We'll be back to talk to winner Sammy Swindell, his brother Jeff, and Brad Doty after this. Flag to flag victory for this man, Sammy Swindell, here at Syracuse today. Brother Jeff in second, Brad Doty third, Kenny Jacobs in fourth, and Bobby Davis Jr. in fifth place. Let's go to Steve with the winner. So Sammy Swindell totally dominates the Syracuse Mile on this afternoon. An absolutely flawless job getting congratulations from Ted Johnson, President of the World of Outlaws. Sam, your strategy appeared to work perfectly. Pass them coming off the turns and make as much power as you can down this straightaway. It couldn't have been any better. Yeah, well, the, 
you know, the old Milwaukee car just worked real good today. The, uh, everything was right. The, the car was working perfect, and uh, the motor was real, real strong. Any moments that had you holding your breath? Well, just that the one time when those two guys got together, you know, a couple cars ahead of me, it was a bunch of dust, and, and I couldn't see anything. Uh, so I, I figured they'd go to the out. You know, they had to slide out. So the only chance I had was to just stay right on the bottom. Well, race driving doesn't get any better than you did today. Congratulations, Sammy Swindell. Okay, thank you. Let's go to Brock Yates with the younger member of the Swindell family finishing in the second place. Well, as we watch uh, Jeff Swindell get out, a little handshake from the starter, climbing out, uh, taking off his collar, helmet off. I'll tell you what, Jeff, uh, you're regular Jimmy the Greek. You said it was going to be the Swindell brothers all the way, and uh, it sure turned out that way. Yeah, well, I just wish we'd had a little bit better competition there. I think, uh, I mean, between me and Sammy, uh, uh, you know, we got to catch him there that one time with that tire, and we had to rev, we had to take that tire off and had to put another different uh, size wheel and everything on it. It didn't, the car wasn't as fast as it was then with the other tires. So I'm not going to complain about second. I just, I, I kind of wish that uh, we could have been up there and run with him a little more, though. Well, uh, you had that uh, vibration with the tire, and of course, uh, Brad was uh, thought he, maybe he was going to be able to catch you, but it seems though after you made that second fuel stop that uh, you sorted that out and uh, uh, picked up the pace a little bit. Yeah, well, once we got that vibration, that vibrating tire off, you know, I could run it just a little bit harder. So, uh, you know, that picked up probably a half a second or so at least, I'd say, you know, just taking that thing off. But uh, I'm not going to complain. A bunch of guys didn't finish, and I've I've not finished up here before, you know. And we we're norm when we finish, we're one, two, or three up here, you know. So I'm not going to complain about that, you know. I'm just glad everybody come out to see us, and I uh, hope everybody had a good race. You know? Oh, they did. Tennessee boys did good. I think Bobby Davis up in the top five too. Well, that's good. I'm glad to see him come up like that. All right. Congratulations. All right. Thanks a lot. Thanks to Strohs and everybody. Super job. Thanks. Let's go to Steve Evans with the third place finisher. Talk about the comeback kid, Brad Doty, finishing in the third spot. And, uh, Brock, I don't think any of us thought this was going to happen, maybe including Brad after the problems he had coming out of one. Yeah, I was uh, a little dejected after that deal. Uh, I guess I came at you this point, and we, this is where we were running. We were running third when we got spun out, so we're back to third, so I'm, I'm real happy. We had a motor start missing. I mean, I'm not complaining or anything. I'm just happy to finish third. We're real lucky because after that deal, uh, you know, we could have been way back. You know, at one point it looked like you were gathering up Jeff Swindell, and then you fell back. Is that when the motor started to kind of pop on you? Yeah, the motor got to miss, and it, on that one restart, it wouldn't, it wouldn't take off, and they got away from me a little bit. When we'd run, when, we, when we'd run four or five laps, uh, the motor seemed like it'd clean out, and I'd start to catch me, and then we'd have a yellow, and then it'd run, you know, bad for a few laps, and then it'd clean out again. So, <laughs> you certainly have everyone's admiration here for never giving up in this race. Well, I thank them for that. Brad Doty finished third, and what a drive. Boy, it sure was, Steve. And now let's get down to Nashville for some final thoughts from Ed Bruce. Well, as promised, a unique day of sprint car racing. Our congratulations to Sammy Swindell, whose domination of this event demonstrated why he's a World of Outlaw champion. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next week. For Brock Yates and Steve Evans, I'm Ed Bruce. Have a good day. The executive producer for American Sports Cavalcade is Harvey M. Pallage. Produced and directed by John B. Mullen. Promotional